So we want to pick up this story again in Luke chapter 2. We saw the setting as Joseph and Mary, by all accounts, by all visual clues, an average family, and maybe even, maybe even that we would say this family is, is a poor family. One thing that we looked at here, that they're following the mandate of the law, just as they should as a good Hebrew family. But you know this provision of two turtle doves or two young pigeons, that was a provision for poverty. That there's a prescribed sacrifice for everything, and usually it's a, it's a, a lamb, a goat. But if you can't afford that, you come with a pigeon or a dove, and you can buy those two for a penny. And maybe that's just an indication that this family, there's nothing incredible, nothing visually extraordinary about them. But there's something extraordinary about them because, and it's been revealed, that this is God's salvation. We want to look to see what happens next in this story. And as we look to see what happens next in this story, we're introduced to another character in the story. And this is Simeon, and this is the one I mentioned. I I don't know that I've ever heard a Christmas song written about Simeon. Anybody? All right, somebody get on that for us. So next season, we'll sing the Simeon song in there. That would be good. We were introduced to Simeon. Look at how Luke describes him. In starting in verse 25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And, he, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your servant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Let's dig into this this scene for a minute and understand this man, Simeon. Luke describes him very briefly for us. He's a righteous man. He tells us he's a righteous man. And that word righteous, we can take a couple different ways biblically. And they kind of mesh, morph together here. But one way that we talk about a righteous man is that he was declared to be right. Maybe that's what is indicated here by Luke through the influence of the Holy Spirit, that this is a man who was declared to be right. Remember in Romans chapter 4, Paul writing to the Romans, talking about Abraham, and just makes this statement that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned, it was counted to him as righteousness. So maybe that same description here fits Simeon. That Simeon was a man who just took God at his word. He paid attention to the promises, he paid attention to the prophecies, and he just took that to to heart. He took God at his word and God says, you know, that's righteousness. That's what I want from all of my people, just to believe what I tell them and to act upon what I tell them, even if you see it or not. That's faith. That's righteousness. And so maybe we get that indication that this is Simeon, and he is taking God at his word. He's a righteous man, and God has declared him to be a righteous man. Now, that word, and maybe it goes along with it, but we could simply understand it that he was one who did what was right. He was righteous. He did what was right, but not like the Pharisees did what was right. Often it was true of the Pharisees that they would do all the right things, but they would do it for show. They would do all the right things, but they did it to be noticed and to be recognized and to be honored and to be esteemed by those around them. And you can do the right things and not have a right heart, and that's not righteousness. So maybe when we talk about Simeon, We're talking about a man who was just very careful to do the right things because they were the right things to do. And he took God at his word, and maybe these mesh together. He took God at his word, and he just simply wanted to please the Lord in everything that he did. He was just very careful to walk before the Lord and to do what was right. Maybe that's how we need to think of him because that kind of fits the next word in the description. What's it say next? 
And there was a man in Jerusalem, verse 25 says, and his name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. Devout. Now, again, there's a couple different ways that we can take this word, this devout. Um, often, we kind of give that an almost a negative connotation. That it, he's a devout, he's a devout Christian, he's really devout in his religion. And, and sometimes we, we think of it just as a strictness. Sometimes we almost think of it being fanatic in following the rules and following the mandates, which is not a bad thing, by the way. But maybe we look at that, that he was just a very strict observer of all of the laws, of all of the regulations, that he was a pious man, that he was a devout man. And that was probably true, but not in a negative sense. This word, if we were readers of Greek, we would notice that this word is eulabes. And eulabes means, at the very root, is to have a good grasp of, to grasp a hold of something. And now think about that definition as we plug that into devout, that he was a righteous man, he took God at his word, and he really grabbed a hold of these things of the law and these things of the Lord. He, he grabbed them tightly, and he held to them tightly. Now, that goes along with that idea of being devout and being pious and being a strict observer. But let's give that another little nuance, and we'll say it this way, that here was a man who had a good grasp on the things of the Lord. It wasn't just rules and regulations for him. It wasn't just laws that he had to follow, but he had a good grasp of that. He, under, he had a sense of where God was taking him and taking the people, that he had a good grasp on prophecy, that he had a good grasp, we'll say it this way, he had a good grasp on the word of God and the promises of God. That's a great statement. I, I hope that that's true of us, that we are devout in the sense that we just have a good grasp of what God is doing, and we hold fast to that, and we love that, and we do what is right because it is right. But it's the next thing that we see that I think is the most interesting. Verse 25 says, And there was this man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. Let me, let's you give it this title. He was righteous, he was devout, and he was also hopeful. He was hopeful. I want you to notice this. See this very carefully. The consolation of Israel. First, let's unfold that word. Again, just the usage of words in our context, in our culture, may not match what it meant back then. The consolation of Israel, I think of consolation as second prize, right? You, you didn't win, but here's your consolation prize. Everybody gets a ribbon and a cupcake, right? Consolation. Just don't want you to feel bad. Here's second place. That's, well, almost what that means. This word consolation comes from another Greek word, parakalesis, to come alongside. To come alongside and give comfort. And the one who comes alongside is a paraclete. And this one would come alongside. So we plug that idea here in. And, and he's saying this is a man who is righteous and is devout and he was hopeful. He was looking forward to, he was longing for this one who would come alongside of the people to bring them comfort bring them hope, to bring them peace. We put those two things together, and here's what we need to understand. Simeon understood that the salvation that he was looking for and longing for and hoping for wasn't gained by being righteous. And the salvation that he was looking for and hoping for and longing for wasn't gained by being devout. He was a righteous man, and he was a devout man, and he was waiting for God to reveal what salvation would look like. He didn't gain it by being righteous. He didn't gain it by following the rules. He didn't gain it by having a good grasp on the promises of God. He was looking for what God would reveal as being that salvation. Here's, here's the thought for us. It's what we want to take home. That salvation is not in what we do for God what God has done for us. It's not in what we do for God. And we could be busy with all kinds of things. 
We could be busy with religious things. We could be busy with church things. We could be busy with, with things that are generous and philanthropic. And, and we could be all about selflessness. But salvation isn't in what we do. Salvation is in what God has done for us. And it was revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't die until he saw it. Until he saw it. So that's where we pick up this story. That he is in the temple. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. Now the story begins. Simeon is there in the Spirit. And by the way, understand just in the Spirit, what does that mean? I don't think that he's there in a trance. He's not there doing religious acts and people kind of steer clear of him. I think it just simply means that the Holy Spirit was just working in his life. The Holy Spirit works differently today than it did then. Today, when we embrace Jesus as Savior, God seals us. He gives us that comforter, that paraclete who comes alongside to give us comfort and instruction. If you have embraced Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit is with you continually wasn't the case before Jesus. It's the case where the Holy Spirit would come upon a man at a certain season, at a certain time, for a certain purpose. And so we're just simply told that the Holy Spirit is at work in his life. Probably not readily obvious. Maybe it was obvious, but he wasn't in a trance. He didn't have an aura about him. He looked like he was doing what he always did. In fact, this is a common everyday scene. Not like our masters paint it. Not like the great art of old where you see Jesus coming in with a halo and, and this baby with an old man face sitting up giving the pious wave. Glowing halo around him. Simeon glowing halo around him. This, this is nothing like that. This is an everyday scene except the Holy Spirit is prompting Simeon. And when he came into the, into the temple when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said now Lord you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation I've seen your salvation and what was the salvation what did he see it's the baby Jesus now why would he say that why on earth would he say that? Because, again, I don't think there's anything about this scene. There's nothing about Jesus that would, would flash Savior, Savior, Savior. Simply it was the Holy Spirit saying, this is salvation. But that's the key. That's the phrase that we want to pick up on. That's what we want to repeat always, that this is salvation. This baby that was born in unusual circumstance, this one that the angels sang about, this one that Joseph and Mary are bringing to the temple just to carry out the customs of the law, this is salvation. This is it. Not in what we do, but in what God has done for us. And it was the Holy Spirit that identified him for Simeon, and it was Simeon who spoke the words that this is it. This is it. You know, when he speaks that word, it is a definitive statement. Often we'll see a child, one that we love, family member. We'll see a little child, small child, and we'll say, you know, that boy's destined for good things. That boy's going to grow up. He's, he's sharp. He's going to be a mogul of business. That little girl, what a great athlete. I can tell already, that little girl is going to be something. And we speak it just as a hope. As, as a generous offering of, of praise and, and graciousness. But when Simeon sees Jesus, he doesn't say, you know, that boy is destined for something big. It's a definitive statement to say, this is salvation. This is salvation. I want you to notice the next thing that he says here. Again, we're in chapter 2. Start at verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the customs of the law, then he, Simeon, took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your servant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared. 
prepared in the presence of all the people. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. A light of revelation. You know, he, he speaks at the same time. It's, it's, uh, it's words of praise and then it's also words of prophecy. And he speaks first the words of praise that this is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And in fact, isn't that who Jesus is? And isn't that what Jesus has done? Isn't that what John describes for us at the beginning of his gospel account? That in Jesus we see who God is. And in Jesus we have the revelation, we have that life to reveal what God has really been about. And it's not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles. It's for the whole world. That in this one, in this child who will grow to be a man and take our place on the cross, we know who God is. God has made himself known. And not just made himself known, but made his purpose known. And made his glory known for all people. And who is it? in Jesus, the Savior. This is the one. This is the light of revelation to the whole world. We also see that he is the glory of Israel. You go back and read what Simeon says. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. You know, one thing that was described about Simeon, Bible scholars sometimes talk about Simeon being uh, the faithful in Israel, sometimes talk about him being the quiet in Israel. Understand at this moment in their history that Israel, Jerusalem, is under the occupation of the Roman Empire. And there were some good, strong, patriotic Hebrews who were all about overthrowing the Roman government with force and violence. In fact, one of Jesus' followers, Simon the Zealot, you know what a zealot is? It's one of those people who advocated overthrow the government with force and violence. We would call him Simon the Terrorist now. Simeon isn't one of those. Simeon is one of the quiet in Israel, one of the faithful in Israel, one of the hopeful in Israel, who just took God at his word and said, you know what, God is going to be our deliverer. God is going to save us. God is going to work his purpose and his plan, and we don't have to fret about that, that God is going to be at work here. And we bring that idea into this next statement when he says that he's going to be the glory of Israel, the glory of his people Israel, that Israel isn't going to restore their own glory. They're not going to reestablish their own self-rule and make their kingdom great again. That's not what the glory of Israel is going to be. This is the glory of Israel, that God is going to be at work. And through this one, through this one, God is going to make himself known. And Israel has been an incredible part of that plan from the beginning. That through one man, a family, and through that family, a tribe, and through that tribe, a nation, and from that nation, the Savior. This is the glory. And in to say that, Simeon, in that sense, is saying this is what God has had in mind all along. And we're not going to provide it for ourselves. We're not going to reestablish glory by ourselves. This is God's purpose and his plan for us. We pull that together and realize that those words are, are true and apt for us. They're, they're applicable for us. That in Jesus, we know who God is. We can strive and struggle to try to find God or to discover God or define him or to make him up, but none of that will be true. None of that will be satisfying. But we know who the Father is through Jesus because God is a God who wants to be known. And part of his purpose in sending his son was to make himself known so that we could be restored to relationship with him. And that's the glory that God wants to reveal. And it's not in our striving. It's not in our efforts. It's not in what we can do for ourselves. It's in what God has done for us. And so we come back again to the statement that this is the Christ. And we've had it a couple times now, even in this passage, that it was at that moment that his name was called Jesus. Yeshua, Yehoshua, God is salvation. And it was at that moment when Simeon took this child in his arms and he said, now I've seen your salvation. I've seen what you have provided for me, and it's in this child. That point, and I want to just kind of wrap things up with this. At that point, his words kind of change from, prophecy, or from praise to prophecy because he makes a couple statements 
that must have been even more startling. It's probably startling for Joseph and Mary, if you just imagine the scene, that they're coming to carry out this rite. And by the way, they're not the only ones there. I think there, there, you know, there may have been dozens of young families coming to do this. This was an everyday scene. But this man, Simeon, that they didn't know before, makes a beeline to them and takes the child in his arms and suddenly speaking these words that are strangely familiar to Joseph and Mary, but they haven't spoken them to anybody else. And then even more startling are the words that follow that. Verse 33, his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. This child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. A lot of things we could pull out of there, and there are a lot of truths that are packed into that little statement. But one is simply this, that this is now the standard. This is the standard of judgment for not just Israel, but for the world. And it's not that that scene of judgment isn't going to be, what were you able to accomplish for God? How much good did you do as opposed to how much bad did you do? It's not in what we do, but it's in what God provided. And that standard of judgment is, what did you do with this revelation that now is salvation? What did you do with that Christ? Did you embrace him as as your own or did you just smile and nod and say yes that's lovely that's nice and then go your way that he's appointed as the fall and the rise of many in Israel that he is now going to be the standard of judgment and you know I I don't know if, if you picked up on that or if it just sounds strange for you but that word order seems off to me he's appointed for the fall and the rise don't we say it the other way the rise and the fall But he's appointed for the fall and the rise. And maybe that's significant simply in this, that really to embrace Jesus as Savior, we have to first come to a place of nothing, of nothingness. That we have to come to a place of complete brokenness. And it's really in understanding what God has provided for us in Jesus that we come to that place of falling and saying, God, I have nothing. There is no spiritual soundness in me. There's no sense of righteousness and worthiness in me. In fact, isn't that what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are spiritually destitute. When we come to that place, when we fall down before him and say, God, I have nothing, but I want what you have to offer me. Then there is the second part of that, the fall and the rise, that he lifts us up and restores us to relationship. He's the judgment. He is the standard. He is the one who is appointed for that. But it's the next thing that we want to look at. That he's appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and a sign to be opposed. And a sign to be opposed. Simply understood this way. That you can't remain neutral when it comes to Jesus. You can't remain neutral. Either love him and embrace him or you reject him. And, and the, the twisted thinking is, well, I guess I can. I guess I can be neutral because I, I appreciate Jesus. I love the story. I just don't have time for Jesus. Well, you know, that's rejecting him. Because if you're not embracing him, you are rejecting him. And you can't remain neutral. And so the question is, as we come to, in a sense, the conclusion of Christmas season, what are you going to do with baby Jesus? What are you going to do? Pack him away for another year and we'll wait until the next season. We'll get him out and we'll have those stirring warm feelings of of family Christmas. Or are you going to embrace him as your own? Come and worship was the invitation. Come and see. Come and embrace this one as your Savior. If you've never embraced him as your Savior, this would be a good day to do that. This would be a good season to do that. To say, I've heard about this Jesus for some time but I've never embraced him as my own never come to the realization that this is God's salvation for me if you've never done that then I would love to pray with you and show you how you can know him as your Savior Father this day we thank you for your goodness to us we thank you for your love we thank you for your word we thank you for Jesus our Savior And just as we spoke with our children, we would pray that 
we would keep Christmas always. That we would always thrill to what you have provided for us. That we, we would always respond by coming and worshiping. And Father, the highest, the greatest worship that we could offer is a life that is yielded to you. So we would do that. We would come and yield to you and say, you are our God. This is our Savior. He is our King. We'll live for you. Father, we thank you that in that you are pleased. We thank you that in that we have the hope of something beyond this life. We would thrill to that all year, Father. Again, this day, Father, we thank you for the time in your word. We would pray that as we leave this place that your blessing would continue to flow down upon us. And we ask, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone.